in order for healthcare operations to really keep up with the complexities of healthcare, new tools and new technologies and new types of analytics are necessary to do that. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management. The center is based at the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. The show, like the center, brings together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare industry. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, Director of the Master's Program in Healthcare Leadership and Management for Professionals. Today, I'm joined by Joan Butters. She's the co-founder and CEO of Exilus, a healthcare technology firm focused on improving healthcare operations through cognitive computing. Welcome to the show, Joan. Thank you so much, Bob. So glad to be here. Well, Joan, we have a lot to cover today. To set the stage for what's going on, I think we both agree that today's American healthcare organizations are going through fundamental structural reform. We're, we're basically moving from a, a client, a craft-based practice, and really turning more to a team-based practice. And I think that introduces a whole new concept of how different tools can be used to solve different types of problems. So why don't you share with us, the listening community here, what your vision is and what your mission is at Exilus. Sure. A, a, a great, great observation. You're absolutely correct. I think that um, if we look at our opportunities and just opportunities across the healthcare community, one of the, the big realizations is that um, in order for healthcare operations to really keep up with the complexities of healthcare, new tools and new technologies and new types of analytics are necessary to do that. So our mission at Exilus is really how do we look at some age-old operational challenges that are pretty endemic across the continuum of care and provide artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, real-time analytics to help solve for those challenges in a different way that, that allow for the people that are associated to those practices, to those operations, to have more time to get back to the bedside, to get back to patient care, to be able to take away a lot of the administrative burden that they have that is impeding them from being able to do that and really use analytics to create more efficiencies so that now the patient, and it's really about care rather than managing the administrative aspects of providing that care. So Joan, there's a lot of terminology that's being used today, and I do not want to assume that people understand what some of these terms mean and also some of the history behind them. So when I hear you mention AI, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, machine learning, and cognitive computing technologies, all those mean something pretty powerful, probably clearly understood by a handful of folks. But to the average practitioner or provider out there in the industry, are these well understood? And can you kind of give us a little bit more of a a safe harbor to understand what those terms mean and how you use them? Sure, absolutely. And and again, uh, uh, point spot on in terms of your observation there. A lot of, you know, we when we start to talk to our constituents about what we do, um, a lot of blank stares often when we talk about cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, particularly in healthcare, because it is very much a, a new concept and somewhat of a, there's a bit of a skepticism behind applying artificial intelligence machine learning to healthcare for a variety of reasons. But, you know, I think the point is, is that the things that we're doing relative to healthcare, uh, using healthcare data is very predominant in, in, in every day, in our everyday life. So if you think about Facebook or you think about uh, your phones or you think about, you know, how ads all, all of a sudden pop up on your Facebook feed, that's all artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. So it, it's funny how a lot of that exists today in our day-to-day life, but yet um, it's not appreciated that that's artificial intelligence or predictive analytics it's um, you know, it's just you you think that that ad pops up for whatever reason, but that's behind the scenes. There's a lot of number crunching and a lot of pattern recognition that happens to have that uh, promote itself in your in in those Facebook feeds. So we apply that same concept, but more on the clinical side is to look at we take we interface directly with hospitals and payers, electronic medical records, which is really a clinical grouping of all of the things going on with the patients and use pattern recognition to determine what uh, a, a similar patient would look like in those same situations. So, so, you know, I guess the point there, Bob, is that it's not 
it's you know I think the concept of applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to healthcare is just a step from what is typically done today in the in the in our day to day life. You know, you hear some of these extremes like Watson in the medical yeah. area, where you know Watson now can beat you in jeopardy, and trying to bring some of these tools into play where they can really be an assistant for some of the the clinicians primarily. I saw a model picture once that was a um, a diagram of an automobile. And it was broken out into all the different components of a car. And they lined all these components up from the tires and all the gears and the doors and windows. And and underneath it, it said that this is how healthcare is purchased and delivered today in a fee-for-service model. Sure. And fee-for-service has been around for quite a while. And I'm curious, do you address how this change takes place from fee-for-service as we get into more value-based purchasing and pay-for-performance? Does, it, does your solution play into that that transformation that's taking place? Certainly, and I think you know I think that um, uh, one of the challenges that faces us in terms of being able to really think about value based care or uh, you know looking at the clinical picture of a patient that then helps to drive what the you know the, the reimbursement layer is is you know first and foremost it's making sure you understand what your patient population looks like and what your what the overall clinical picture of your patient population is. And a lot of the analytics that we provide give insight into that to be be able to better understand that um, patient A can't be managed the same way as patient B and shouldn't be. And I think, you know, in the past, a lot of that has been driven by what the diagnosis of the patient is, not necessarily the total clinical picture of the patient, because if I had diabetes versus somebody with a different, with the different healthcare history, with diabetes needs to be treated differently, needs to be thought about differently. And I think the analytics that we provide really help to, to provide another layer of the difference between those two at, at face value, similar looking patients. Some of these episode-based bundled payments, we're finding more and more ways where these, um, these clinical integrated networks and these accountable care organizations are starting to formulate to work together better, to share best practices, to come up with methods that are more efficient. Um, I would think that some of these analytics and AI and tools that you have would be a natural extension into that marketplace and really be of value as these new organizations start to take form. Yep. And and, and that's a great point. I think one of the things that we, you know, we're, we obviously talk to a lot of different um, healthcare providers across the country, but it's somewhat frustrating to know that <clears throat> something very simple as a handoff uh, within the four walls of a hospital or even even more uh, challenging is the handoff of a patient's um, history or the patient's clinical information across institutions is almost non-existent, right? So I'll give you a good example of that. You know, we're, t- we're focusing a lot today on post-acute care. So a lot of the work that we do today from a hospital perspective is within the acute care setting of a hospital. But the challenge that um, happens is, especially when you think about accountable care and managing that patient's condition across all the different providers that are treating that patient, a lot of times that information from uh, institution to institution isn't necessarily memorialized nor understood. And so I think um, to my point about uh, the, the handoff between institutions and the transfer of information between treating institutions isn't necessarily as clean nor as detailed as it needs to be, especially when you think about um, the transfer of clinical information from point A to point B. That's critical in our ability to manage that patient's condition across the total continuum of care that is a lo- is not necessarily as well developed as it could be. And our analytics really speak to that ability to help see a patient's condition from physician to hospital to post-acute care setting to home delivery of care as well. Well, it sounds to me like you have a very broad spectrum uh, where your solution applies. Let's try to come down from that high level of abstraction. We understand that you've got these powerful tools of it, of AI and analytics and things like that. Uh, how are these directed? Is it is there a consumer play here? Is it directed to the uh, physicians? Is it directed to the uh, the payment of the providers? If you could kind of step us through like a go to market solution, so this becomes very very real to our um, our listening audience the value that you bring into the healthcare industry. Sure, sure. So our 
core business is focused on a division or unit within a hospital called utilization review. And in that operational area within a hospital, the responsibility of the nurses within that unit is to ensure that the patient's level of care, meaning should they be admitted to the hospital or can they be treated as an outpatient, is uh, that decision is made appropriately uh, because of the revenue implications that making the incorrect decision could have for that hospital. So a lot of that work today is done very manually. A lot of, you know, the the building of the patient's need to receive hospital-based care is an exercise of going through a lot of, a lot of data, um, clinical data to make that determination and somewhat subjective because the clinician is making a decision based off of what they see, not necessarily all the data points that are relevant to, to building that patient's story. So the analytics that we provide help automate that decision-making process so that we reduce the amount of um, risk that they're missing important pieces of information that could help drive the rationale or that patient's need to receive hospital-based care. So it, it is a, you know, we call it clinically driven revenue cycle because at okay. the end of the day, if that decision is not made correctly, then the hospital uh, has a risk of losing reimbursement, even though the patient's condition and patient's clinical condition supported the need for hospital-based care. Uh, but they didn't make that determination as they should have given the, the, the support of uh, the, what's going on with the patient. So that's in a nutshell kind of how we help hospitals. Now we're broadening that to also then connecting that dialogue between the payer and the provider because the same process that I just described around what the hospitals, nurses do in, in determining that is similar to what a payer does as well. And so we're applying the same analytics to help create a common framework between the payer and the provider so that data drives what the determination should be, not a nurse on either side of the fence, which can be you know, somewhat jaded by their own, what's driving either of them in terms of what their outcome should be. Okay. So it sounds like uh, you really have a decision support tool that's really you know, being plugged into the environment to help people make better decisions more efficiently, more timely. Um, and that kind of brings up the topic of, you know, some some of the technology that we see today. Um, so I, I could imagine a nurse who has a task of recording certain bits of information may take her 18 hours or take him 18 hours to gather this data that an AI intelligent program might be able to reduce that information down and actually, you know, feed it into an electronic health record or send it right to it like an Apple watch that they're wearing to give them the data to take the action that they need. Is that too much in the future? Or is that something that looks pretty realistically coming down the road? No, not at all. I think that's spot on in terms of what, what the value that our application brings is to take what is typically, and that's why we go back to that term cognitive computing. So yes. that's exactly what the analytics address is take what is typically done very manually today by a human and not to say that the the human is not making the right decision but it's it's very much it is a very laborious and um, administratively expensive task and so what we can do to automate as much of that as possible given the analytics and the predictive and the in reading through the medical records that help pull out the right information at the right time are leaving more time for those nurses to actually care for the patients and not have to you know, manage that administrative aspect of, of uh, reimbursement. This episode is brought to you by the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, the definitive resource for healthcare management education in North Texas. The center is based in the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. It plays a unique role in training the next generation of healthcare leaders to meet local, regional, and national demands. The Jindal School uses its strengths in accounting, administration, finance, marketing, and information systems to educate highly qualified personnel for healthcare administration and executive leadership positions. The center is home to seven healthcare leadership and management programs, including undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as executive programs for physicians and working professionals. For more information, visit us online at jindal.utdallas.edu forward slash healthcare. 
So I've heard many CEOs like yourself say that where there's mystery, there's margin, you know, the top <laughs> secret, secret sauce that you have. The analytics capability, are you finding more and more of the institutions, the hospitals, having talent which understands and trusts the AI cognitive computing environment? Or is that something still held closely by the providers like you? Uh, how broad has been the acceptance level within the industry of such technology? Yep. So I do see, you know, some of the larger institutions are certainly um, and have for a long time have had um units in their four walls around how do you better use data to help drive decisions. I think that that um, the more, more it, you know, I just read an article recently that artificial intelligence, the application of artificial intelligence to hospital operations is in the top 10 uh, focus areas for CTOs or CIOs in 2019. So certainly there's more emphasis on it for organizations I do think that the majority, though, is still being done by outside vendors for a lot of different reasons. You know, it's not just the activity of building the models and the and the predictive um, algorithms, but it's the normalization of the data that challenges hospital organizations. And I also would add to that is um, where Exilus can differentiate ourselves between um, what, what an internal hospital is doing is because we see a much broader type of information coming through. So we're able to use the information that we have across all our hospital and payer clients to create a model that's not specific to that hospital, but but just specific to healthcare in general. Very good. Let's let's discuss the topic of entrepreneurship. Um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in our audience that listen to this podcast, and we know there's a lot of innovation taking place in the healthcare space. Someone asked the question once, what's the future of healthcare? And the answer we got was, the long answer is, I don't know. The short answer is, ah, ah, that stops right there. We don't know what the future is. But at some point in time, this technology, the cognitive computing and artificial intelligence and analytics, they've been applied in a number of other industries, like the airline industry. They've been using technology like this to predict yields for flights, et cetera, and be more efficient. At what point in time... Joan, did it become obvious to you that this was a new opportunity for innovation? If you would share with us your story, how, how you how you directed the company into that pathway. Sure. Yeah, and I think to your point, entrepreneurial is kind of it's somewhat luck and somewhat grit, but I think um, Exilus certainly fits that mold uh, perfectly. Uh, you know, I think that um, my background, even before I founded Exilus, is around data analytics and really the application of analytics to help drive operational efficiencies. Um, I didn't necessarily envision it being applied to making clinical decisions, but certainly not outside the realms of possibility. The, the background there is you know, just listening to what the market, the, the challenges that the market talked to us about. We started our organization very much as a service company, and we're going to you know, apply our, uh, and really approach a problem based off the old way of, of, of managing it, you know, necessary people, putting people on a process, not necessarily technology in the process. You know, I'm not, I'm a pretty impatient person. So when I started uh, doing that, I'm like this, there's got to be a better way for us to be more efficient in our outcomes. And so that's really what um, drove a lot of the, the migration to more of an analytics and technology platform. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that your audience has heard of meaningful use and all the the value that meaningful use brought to the healthcare uh, community in the capturing of data. You know, Exilus happened to be, um, we founded Exilus right at the, the the pinnacle events of meaningful use where data was much more accessible. So that's that luck portion of it. So my frustration with a manual process and then uh, the fact that meaningful use afforded us access to information that once wasn't available. So, you know, I think in all the kind of the perfect storm happened that we looked at what our opportunities were, the availability of data, the opportunity for us to, to take what was a very manual process and automate it. Now, that didn't happen overnight. Um, you know, there's a lot of skepticism for us as a company and in the market around, you know, how are you going to do what my nurses have been doing for 30 years, veterans in the industry, you know, really, you know, um, knowledgeable about their craft, how are analytics going to replace that? Um, and so it did take us a while to convince the market that 
this is a better approach and that analytics can help solve for some of those challenges that you have. And I think at the end of the day, those that have embraced that technology and that approach really see that as an opportunity to um, address, you know, the burnout that their that their employees have. Really allow those, like I said before, really allow those nurses and and the the, the people to get back to the bedside and do what they why they became a nurse is to care for patients, not to manage an administrative aspect of, of providing care. Um, but it, it's exciting. I think that more and more organizations are embracing the concept. And I, you know, uh, rightly or wrongly, I'd like to, to suggest that Exilis has helped pave the way for that. So, Joan, um, I always like to ask the founder or co-founder of a company about the company name and your, your company name, Exilis. Why don't you share with us how you came up with that name and a little bit of the background on that? Sure. sure. Um, it's a, you know, we get a lot of questions about that. We certainly get a lot of questions around how do you pronounce the, the name. But um, uh, it, you know, if you look at it, it it's, it's somewhat creative but somewhat corny. <laughs> um, it's actually uh, silo spelled backwards. Um, and then uh, with an X to say, hey, we need to, as an organization, one of the foundational objectives is to reduce the silos in healthcare. If you think about silos within a hospital, silos between a payer and a provider, silos um, between a patient and a provider, a lot of what we do is focused on connecting the dots and and using and and having data be the common ground and analytics be the common ground between all the different constituents within the healthcare continuum. Yes, I think every large organization has these built-in silos. No matter what industry you're in, people are not you know sharing data as forthright as they should. That's pretty interesting. There was another company down in Austin, Texas, that was purchased by IBM, and their name was Tivoli, T-I-V-O-L-I. And you spell that backwards, it was I love it. Oh. I love it. And that's how they that's how they named their company. Tivoli was I love it. And here you are with Exilus. What a great name. What a great organization that you've put together. In closing, uh, Joan, um, what type of um, advice would you give to the people that are trying to redefine healthcare within our political organization. Where do you see some of the directions going there that could make some big differences? Do you have any strong thoughts or theories that you might want to share with the group? Yeah, and, and I'm I'm a pretty simple thinker, but I you know my recommendation is exactly that, right? I think there's you know we can do a lot. You know we sit on a lot of um, clinical information, uh, billions of, of words, millions of uh, different. Uh, discrete data points, clinical data points. You know, the challenge for my organization is always not to chase the next shiny object, or be, be very focused in you know kind of what the what the impact and what the outcome could be. I think when you look at you, know, we're not we're not in the business of trying to cure cancer. <clears throat> and I think when you start to think about artificial intelligence and machine learning, a lot of organizations are looking for the big bang and the 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 the, the wow analytics. We're, you know, I think that there's enough at the very basic level of challenges that the healthcare community has that can be addressed through artificial intelligence without it having to be, you know, the next cure for cancer. You know, look at the fundamentals, identify those those things that are um, very, in, you know, almost right in front of us. That even the most simplest of um, uh, there's there's very simple applications of artificial intelligence that have huge impacts on healthcare. Well, very good. Joan, Joan Butter is the CEO and co-founder of Exilus. What a great time we've had with you today. We want to thank you sincerely for participating on our podcast. And we really wish to hear more from you as you progress down the path. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it, Bob. And thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Business of Healthcare podcast. Join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com to find episode links, notes, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Healthcare podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, go to jundle.utdallas.edu and then search under the Center and Institutes tab on the navigation menu. Also, we want to hear from you. If you'd like to provide feedback, make suggestions for future guests or show topics, or just want to get in touch with us, email us at healthcarebizpodcast at utdallas.edu. Biz is spelled B-I-Z. And let us know how we're doing. 
I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, with the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, where we're leading change by changing how we lead. 